everybody, good morning, and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John, I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and it is such a blessing to have you joining us this morning. Hey, if you've just arrived, why not leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well, or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, eagrm.org. Just drop us a line, and we'll connect with you right away. Now it's just about time for Sunday morning to get started. So if you haven't already, right now is the perfect time to get a Bible, get a warm coffee, and let's get ready for another great morning of worshiping God and hearing from His Word at All Line Church. We trust you, Jesus. Sing together, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire. Spirit washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Oh, I trust, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never.
today, we want to go to a couple passages. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll probably have the words up there for you, but it's good for you to look in your Bible. I've got several Bibles, and they're all marked up. One of the first gifts this church gave me uh, for like a pastor appreciation gift or whatever was a new Bible, because they saw the one I had was falling apart and everything, and it was, and I, I appreciate a new Bible, but the thing about a new Bible, you got to get that thing all ready, you know, because, uh, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a Bible just like I had except they had added a few things and all the pages were different. Now, I don't know how your memory is, but I, I can remember that, that in my Bible, 1 Corinthians 13 is on the left side of the page and things like that. You know, and so when I go to my new Bible, it's a little bit different. But anyway, it's good to have the Bible. It's okay to mark it up a bit to remember things. And so uh, today I'm continuing this series about unheard that, that I'm, I'm just excited about. And, and, and we're looking at a lot of un-things, other things that we need to kind of undo so that we can live unhindered lives. Now, it's easy to get stuck, right? If you, if you travel a lot, you know, you get stuck in traffic, you get stuck in a long line. Uh, when I think about being stuck, I thought about when they were do, getting ready to do the carpet in this church a couple years ago. Uh, they, they put glue all the way in the outside. And they had done that before I had a chance, you know, to get a coat of paint on the bottom. And so while they were gone... You know, I wanted to get that paint on while they went to lunch. And so, so I started out with my, my socks and shoes on, and I did the best I could to, to stand where I could just reach over and do it. But, but after a while, I, my, my shoes had, had hit the uh, glue, so I had to take my shoes off. And then after a little while, my socks hit the glue, and I had to take those off. And so uh, by the time I got back, I was barefoot, you know, trying to go around. Trying to get that glue off was, was hot, but, you know, you know, you know, stuck. We, we all get stuck with different things. But one of the things that, that really can really mess us up is when we get stuck spiritually. Amen. We get stuck in life. We get stuck where we can't move forward. We get stuck where we wonder, you know, what's happening? Why is this happening? Our, our wheels are spinning, which means we're praying. We're reading the Bible. We're going to church. We're doing all that we know to do. But, but we're not going anywhere. It doesn't seem like we are. And maybe it's because something happened to you. Or maybe you experienced some kind of traumatic event. Or, and it caused you to get stuck. Maybe you had a question Maybe you prayed for somebody, you know, to be healed or whatever, and they didn't make it. And, 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 you, and it's just blowing your way, and you're stuck. And, and when you get stuck, what happens is sometimes you can begin to lose your joy. You lose your peace. You lose your sense of purpose. You can lose the praise, you know, that song in your heart that we're supposed to have. And, and the greatest issue that people get stuck in, I believe, is the issue of unbelief. Unbelief affects believers, it affects unbelievers. And in, in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, the Bible gives a stern, a stern warning about the issue of unbelief. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. 
That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. There's that word rest. We're going to talk about that tonight from the Old Testament. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original, original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Verse 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. My message today is get untangled from the dangerous web of unbelief. Get untangled. When I, when I, when I say get, you know, it sounds like, well, we've got to do something. Yeah, we've got to put ourselves in the position where we allow the Holy Spirit to help us with what we might de be dealing with in, the, in regards to unbelief. Amen? So this is the fourth message in a series of unhindered. You know, we, we've talked about religion. We've talked about uh, anxiety and all those type of things. And, and this unhindered is the last word in the book of Acts. And, and I love this word because it speaks of the Apostle Paul preaching and teaching Jesus. He's in Rome living in his own rented house underneath the nose of Nero who's trying to control the world with, with all of that. But yet here's Paul unhindered doing God's work. Friends, I don't care, you know, you know, what we hear that our government does. Or be, Listen, we can live unhindered lives. God's word will not be unhindered. Amen. It will accomplish everything that it was set out to do. Father, I pray that today that this message just sits in our hearts. It grows. It matures. It leads us to that place where we need to be. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Author Philip Yancey speaks about going for a cup of coffee with a friend who admitted he was thinking of leaving his wife after 15 years of marriage. He had fallen for someone younger and prettier. Yancey's friend was a Christian man with three kids. He asked Philip, he said, do you think God can forgive something as awful as what I'm about to do? In other words, he's asking, doesn't God have to give me another chance? Isn't God obligated to forgive me? Isn't that what God does? And the story goes that Yancey sat across the table for his friend for quite a while before he answered the question. And here's what he finally said. He said, can God forgive you? Of course. You know the Bible. He'll forgive us. The problem is the distance you'll place yourself from God if you do this. See, you think forgiveness, but will you want it then? Will you still care about even being forgiven or trying to get your life back on track? See, God forgives. He doesn't change, but we do. We do. In Psalm 32, David speaks about the effect that sin had on him. He got tangled up with, with Bathsheba. For a while, he didn't deal with it. And he was trying to hide it. He even had Bathsheba's husband killed. I mean, David, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. But this guy, you know, he did some pretty sketchy things, awful things. So here's what David writes in Psalm 32. He said, when I kept silent, in other words, when I didn't talk about it, when I didn't pray about it, when I didn't get right with God, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, God's hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And friends, I'm saying that when we get tangled in a web, and we go through our resources to try to figure it out ourselves, we're just going to get worn out because we're not capable of helping ourselves that way. I don't care if you try to deny it or justify it or rationalize it. None of that will work. And so sin has two big effects on people, shame and guilt, shame and guilt. Guilt reminds us of what we've done. Shame tries to convince us that what we've done is irreversible, that even God can't do anything about it. That's just who we're going to be the rest of our life. Now, that's, the devil is involved with guilt and shame. You know that, right? So the guilt of David's sin weighed him down because guilt is an anchor to the past. We, we try to move forward. You know, we try to get unstuck, but that anchor holds. You know, ships don't sail well when the anchor is let down. Guilt keeps you from moving forward, but shame, shame just says, hey, listen, accept that that's going to be your destiny. You're stuck here for the rest of your life. And friends, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And guilt and shame are difficult to overcome. In fact, we can't do it on our own. We try to replay the highlights. Really, they're, they're the lowlights. This is where I messed up. This is where I missed my opportunity. And, and what we know that sin does, it separates us from God. It builds that wall that cuts us off from God and then, uh, you know, helps us accuse God for the wall being there. 
Now, there are ways that we, we deal with it. We avoid God. We avoid church. We dodge those we hurt. We don't go to the places where we messed up or whatever. We pretend it's good and we just press on. And the readers of Hebrews needed to understand how sin really worked, that they're going to be avoid being entangled in it. And Jesus did what the law could not. He gave himself as an offering. And when we get to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it, says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with a full assurance that faith brings, having our bodies, excuse me, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to hope we profess, for he, God who promises faithful, Jesus is faithful. He's the only one that can get us unstuck, amen, and untangled from the web of, of guilt and shame and all of that. See, none of our failures need to be counted. All of them can be forgiven. And the punishment that we should have received was put on Jesus when he was crucified. And so what Jesus does is he trades in, you know, his perfection for our sin straight up. You, you don't have to come up with impossible credentials showing that you've never sinned, never screwed up, never fallen short. Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You get that word, all. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. We are justified freely. Everybody like that word free? By his grace. Now you might hear this and say, okay, pastor, I know this. It just means that we're forgiven. But no, it's so much more than that. We're not only forgiven of our failure, but we're also credited with the righteousness of Jesus. It's like being told that not only did you make the team, but, but you've got all the stats and honors to be the team MVP. The doctrinal term for this is imputed righteousness. Impute is a word that we don't you, you use a whole lot, but it means to credit. Jesus has a perfect credit core in righteousness, and it's given to us when we believe in Christ. Hello? Friends, I don't know about you, but that's a good deal. Now, now, here's what happens, though. Some people hear that. The Jews even heard that. And they didn't think about it this, but their eyebrows got, and, and they think, that doesn't seem fair. People should get what they deserve, right? I can't get 100 on a test at school and take my paper to the teacher and say, hey, you, you know, get, you know let, let the flunky in the last row have my score. It doesn't work that way, right? You know, a bank won't consider the credit rating of the guy down the street before giving you a loan, right? It's based on, on your credit. That's true. But Romans 3, verse 25, the very next verse, explains it this way. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to receive by faith. The operative word there is faith. Everybody say that word, faith. faith. It's the power is in Christ, but faith activates it. And guess who has to have the faith? You and I. And guess what Jesus said about faith? Every one of us has a measure of it. We've got enough. We've got enough to get this thing started. But it could also be said that unbelief is the opposite of having faith. Hebrews 11 defines faith this way in the NIV. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, we've, most of us memorize this in King James. Faith is the evidence of, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, unbelief is an uncertainty in what God has said and a skepticism about what we don't see, right? Wouldn't that be what unbelief is? Uncertainty be in, in what God has said and skepticism about what we don't see. We've all been taught, you know, or we've grown up thinking, I'm not going to believe it till I see it, you know? You know, kid, kids like, you know, I love when my kids were growing up and now my grandkids and they, they get a hold of some of these little joke books and different things and, they, and they'll say, they'll do something like this. Poppy Bear, do you th think I can poke my head through this hole? I said, no, it's too small. And they go, boop, poke their head through the hole. And different little things like that. But, but we're told, you know, that we're not supposed to believe until we see. It doesn't work that way with God. We've got to believe and then we'll see. We've got to believe and we've got to walk through that door by faith, believing what God says life would be, what we should have happen in our life. We, then, then we'll see it. And I'm just telling you that's how it works. Faith has confidence that God is trustworthy. Unbelief doubts God's intentions. Faith trusts God. Unbelief takes matters into our own hands. Faith trusts that righteousness is given to us through Jesus. Unbelief doubts that we can be made right that way. Faith enables us to repent of sin, knowing that we can be forgiven. Unbelief convinces us, you know, we've gone too far. We can't be forgiven. We, you, we feel stress, anxiety, and fear when we don't believe what God's word says. Do I really believe God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in time? Do you believe that? 
Do you really believe that in all things God works for the good to those that love him and are called to his Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that nothing can separate you from the love of God? I'm quoting scripture here. Do you believe that God's mercies are new every morning? You know, we don't have to live on stale mercies from yesterday. They were new today. Hallelujah. Th th these are things that we say, but they need to be things that we believe. Amen. These are scriptures we quote, but, but, but we need to believe them or else we'll fall into the weight of unbelief. And so maybe, you know, the struggle that people have is with greed because they don't believe Jesus meet their needs, so they've got to do it. Maybe they struggle with lust because they don't believe what God teaches about sex in the Bible. Maybe people struggle with selfishness because they, they don't believe it's better to give than receive. Maybe people struggle with discouragement because they don't believe that God is at work, or they struggle with bitterness because they don't believe that God is just, that, that it seems like evil people get away with stuff. Maybe people struggle with control because they don't believe God can be trusted or that God does, uh, he doesn't really care. Or maybe you struggle with guilt because you don't believe God can really forgive you. And sometimes the issue, we've got to learn to forgive ourselves. Amen? And God helps us do that. And maybe people struggle with shame because they don't really believe that God has made them a new creation because they look at the same old body in the mirror every day but refuse to look at it spiritually. Amen? Pastor and author Kyle Ottoman says, when our guilt turns into shame then our sin becomes our identity. When we believe that we have, when we believe that what we have done is who we are, then we will lose heart. It will feel impossible to move forward under the weight of our shame and guilt and eventually we'll give up. Here's the turning point of the message here. Realize that your identity is not based on what you've done or not done. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Amen. And faith says, I believe that. And so Jesus gives his righteousness to you, say, Lord, here, I'm giving you my filthy rags, my old sinful life, and he gives us his new life. Friends, that's the Bible truth, and, and that's what we need to believe. Now, once, you know, we all had terrible words that described who we were, you know, cheater, dropout, fired employee, absentee parent, sinner, whatever. But, but friends, when you're saved and the devil goes to open up your case file so he can accuse you of all that stuff, guess what? It's empty. All of that stuff that you've done that we're guilty of, it's been redacted. Amen? You're forgiven. You're righteous. You're beloved. You're a full heir of Father God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to this issue of unbelief, the reason why we need to get untangled from this web of it is, is I want to talk about how it affects two types of people. First of all, the issue of unbelief for a non-Christian. It's critical. It's critical because it affects and it determines their eternal destiny, Right? You, you, you understand that, right? We're all born in sin. We all got this disease. But just in case you haven't heard this, Christianity is a fact of history. Yeah. Jesus was a real person who lived. That's not debatable. That, that's historical fact. He really did die on a cross. That's a fact. Yeah. Now, now, where the trouble comes is that he rose from the dead. People don't want to believe that, but it's true. That's what separates Christianity from every other world religion. Jesus is the person of our faith. He's the founder of our faith. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus in John chapter 2, he's confronted by the Jews. They didn't like the fact that he drove the money changers out of the temple. And they said to him, what sign do you do to show us that you can do these things? And Jesus said, I'm going to destroy this temple and build it in three days. And they said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days. But John, in chapter 2, adds a little parenthetical phrase that says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body, right? You know the, that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit now if we're, you know, if we're saved. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's why in Acts 4.12 it says, there is salvation and no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So the disciples were hiding out when Jesus was crucified. Peter denied him three times and even knew him. He had been with him for three years. Peter walked on water and did all this stuff. They didn't believe. The disciples didn't believe. The woman came back from the empty tomb and said, he's alive. Thomas was there when he did appear to the others. And, and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I put my fingers in his hands and my hand in his side. I'll not believe. Well, Jesus did appear to Thomas and he said, Thomas, here I am. Put your fingers in my hand, put your hand in my side, and be not unbelieving, but believe. Amen. And suddenly the early believers went from being fearful to being the most fearless people on the planet. And the Bible says they and the other early believers turned the world upside down with the gospel, the message of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now it's been said that no one dies for a lie. And some have argued that people die for a lie all the time. 
the guys that flew the planes at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, they died for a lie because they thought they were doing what Allah said to do, and, you know, and that they would get some special favors when they died and went to heaven and virgins and all this kind of stuff that they abuse on earth, that somehow that's going to be their prize in heaven. Crazy talk, right? The people who die for a lie do it because they think it's the truth, right? They thought that was the truth. Of, they were led to believe that was the truth. Now, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all the disciples who died for the gospel died for a lie. But no one dies for a lie knowing it's a lie. I mean, people can put up a good front but you, until you put the gun to their head and they say, okay, 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 you got me. You know, that wasn't the truth. This is the truth. Well, that didn't happen. Friends, all the disciples except John were martyred for their faith. When we do the Living Lord's Supper, we, we talk about how they all died. Some were, some were torn apart. You know, they, if you've ever read, you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs and seen all the ways that they've tortured Christians through the ages. It's horrible. Peter was crucified upside down. Now, John was boiled alive in oil, didn't kill him. They put him on the Isle of Patmos where he had the revelation, the last book of the Bible, but, but he died, you know, a natural death. You know, he got old and skin got even more wrinkly, obviously. And well, then we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And people say, well, you can't believe the Gospels because they're part of the conspiracy. That's why there's so much common, you know, in the Gospels. But then you have a Roman historian by the name of Publius Cornelius Tactus, and he talks about Jesus who was condemned to death by Pontius Pilate. That's a historical fact. He's not a Christian. He's a Roman historian. You have another guy named Pliny the Younger, and he writes as a Roman governor about Jesus. Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about Jesus. And so it's there. After his resurrection, Jesus saw the disciples. They saw him. Jesus walked through walls, but he ate with them. So that's kind of cool. Amen? You know, some people can eat too much and get stuck in a door maybe or whatever. But hey, hey, as, as I guess in that, you know, we can just walk through walls and still eat. They ate with them. He appeared to 500 people at one time. And the truth of Christianity is a fact of history that and you say, okay, Pastor, it's a fact. Of, then why do so many people not believe it? Well, because the problem of unbelief is a problem of the heart, not the head. Amen. You can read the history books and see all this. But unbelief is a problem of the heart. There are two verses in the Bible that speak about this. And they almost say exactly the same thing. Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1. And it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And what he's saying, there is no God for me. You know, I'm going to be my own God. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to submit myself to any other deity or anything like that. And that's why in John 3, 16, the gospel in a nutshell says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The very next verse, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then in verse 19, it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So it's an issue of the heart. People don't believe because, you know, they might know the truth. There, there are some very smart people that know all about the Bible, but just aren't saved. And by the way, you know, the devil knows all about Jesus. He knows all about the Bible and history. He knows all about our own lives, but yet, you know, he doesn't believe. See, we, the end result of unbelief is eternal hell. Well, people say, well, a good God is not going to send people to hell, is he? Well, you've got to look at it this way. You're already going there. You were born with a disease called sin. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Say it, it's death. Now, spiritual death. So we all have this disease, and it's going to kill you. It's going to kill you physically. It's going to kill you spiritually. And that's why the Bible calls hell the second death. Okay, physical death is when our spirit leaves our body, right? And people have tried to weigh. They've tried to do experiments to weigh somebody right before they die and weigh, weigh them after. And I think, what do they say? That maybe our spirit weighs like 17 grams or something? I don't know. Don't quote me on that. You know, you read all kinds of stuff. But, but we have this disease, and if we continue in unbelief, we're going to die. And, and, and if that unbelief doesn't, you know, if, if we don't understand that Jesus came to save us, we just blow it off and say, listen, I don't want that remedy. God, I don't want what you did. Then it's not God's fault that anybody goes to hell. It's your fault. So here's how, here's how it is. You know, people send themselves to hell. By the way, hell was made for the devil and his fallen angels. It wasn't made for people. But when people chose to go away from God in unbelief, then, then they're choosing it. They choose to live in this life without God, and so God honors them in the afterlife. So unbelief is critical for an unbeliever. Secondly, the issue of unbelief for a Christian is costly. 
It's costly because it affects our walk of faith. Are we going to really live this abundant life? We just kind of pretend a little bit. Is it really going to work out? Back to Hebrews 3, verse 12, it says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now, the unbelieving heart that's used here doesn't mean honest doubt. It means a refusal to believe. It means a hardened, stubborn heart that refuses to believe in the Lord. See, the Christian's life I mentioned is about faith. It's a walk of faith. We enter the Christian life by faith. We continue our Christian life by faith. Colossians verse 2 says it like this. As you have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. How to receive the Lord? By faith. We believe the gospel message. We believe that by faith that our sins are forgiven if we accept Christ. So how do we keep walking? By faith. So God promises our experience through faith. Everything in the Christian life is through faith. And that's why it says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So if you don't have faith, then you're not believing God. You can't please him. It's impossible because faith is the currency of Christianity, we believe. And friends, let me say it again. You believe so that you can see. Okay? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. God. When you hear the word of God, you need to take it and unite it to faith. And how do you unite it by faith? You go ahead and do what the Bible says. Whatever it might be for you. Wherever you are in your Christian walk, whatever you're learning, there's something in the word says, man, you read that, I say, I'm not doing that right now. Well, let the Holy Spirit lead you to do that or to say that or be like that. You believe it, you act on it. That's what faith is. It's taking God at its word. Now, let me just say this right here. If you're struggling with doubt, that's okay. God's okay with that if you have doubts. John the Baptist struggled with doubts. I mean, he baptized Jesus, and later when he gets thrown in prison, he has doubts, and he sends a couple of his disciples, you know, to where Jesus was, and he says, and he tells the guys, ask Jesus, are you the one, are you the one, the Messiah, or is there someone else? So John the Baptist, he's going through a tough time in his life. He's locked in prison. He's about to be headed. He doesn't know he's about to be headed, but he's having some doubts. And listen, when you have doubts, it's okay to bring it to the Lord. It's okay, you know, to come to him with the life questions you have and the things that you don't understand. It's like the man who had a demon-possessed son in the, in the book of Mark. And, if you, and he says, if you can do anything to help us, please help us. And Jesus said, all things are possible to him who, what? Believes. believes. And the man said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I think that's where most of us are. We believe, but Lord, help our unbelief. God, we believe you for salvation. We believe you for this and this and this. But God, right now, I, 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 you know, I need healing in my body. I'm believing you for healing, God, and it's not happening yet. You understand what I'm saying? This, this is where our, our life is lived. But Hebrews here is not talking about honest doubts. It's talking about hardened hearts and, un, and disbelief. Apostasy appears twice in the New Testament as a noun. In Hebrews 13, 312 here, it's a verb which means to turn away. The Greek term is defined as falling away, defection, rebellion, abandonment, withdrawal, or turning away from what one has formerly turned to. Now, this is important because in another book of the Bible, it says in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. There's going to be a falling away of, 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 of people that, that at one time loved God. Now, I don't know what that totally means, falling away, if they, if they fall all away. But to apostatize means to sever or save a relationship with Christ or withdraw from vital union with him. And it's only possible for those who've already experienced salvation. Now, the example that we have here is the children of Israel. Okay, they get taken out of Egypt. The ten plagues happen. It scares, you know, you know what, uh, out of everybody because God is awesome. There's the firstborn of the dead. They're saved by the blood over the doorpost. They march right on out. A couple million of them march right out of Egypt. You know, the, the Egyptian army chases after them. God miraculously opens up the Red Sea. They all walk through, the Bible says, on what? Dry ground. They walk through, they get on the other side. Pharaoh's armies try to come, they get drowned, you know, in, in the Red Sea. They, they get taken, they get to a place where there's no water. God gives water, they, they don't have food, he gives them manna. They get to Mount Sinai, they get the Ten Commandments. They get to the border of the Promised Land at a place called Kadesh Barnea. And, and Moses sends out spies, 12 of them, one from each tribe, they come back. Ten of them have a negative report, says, listen, there are giants here. They're going to kill us if we go in. There's no way that we can do it. Even though God already said, you can do this, I'll be with you. Joshua and Caleb, the only two, said, hey, let's do what God said do. Well, guess what? The negative report overshadowed the positive report. 
and they spent the next 40 years like a NASCAR race, supposed to be the Daytona 500 day, I don't know if it's rained out or not, but going around it, if you, if you look at it, it's gonna look like they're, <laughs> they're just going in circles in the desert for 40 years. The people wept, so we can't go in the land, they're giants. Why did the Lord bring us here, only kill us in the wilderness? And the Lord was angry with them, and it says in Numbers 14, going back to when this actually happened, and the Lord said to Moses, <coughs> how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me? Despite all the signs which I performed, in other words, you know, the miracles in the desert, everything that happened, oh, by the way, did I mention there was a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? So they, they, they saw God's presence every day. Not just a little bit, you know, here and there. So God is not just a little perturbed. But he's angry. He's grieved. He's displeased. He's disgusted. And he basically wants to wipe all of them out and just start a whole new chosen people, just Moses and his family. And God says, and Moses, God, don't do that. Don't do that. God says, how long will they not believe me? In spite of all the signs I have done in their midst. And that's why it says in verse 12, take care, brethren, lest there should be any in you an evil, unbelieving heart falling away from the living God. What's, what's the Lord telling you to do that you're not doing? What's the Lord asking you to believe that you're not believing? See, unbelief for the lost person is critical because it results in eternal. Unbelief for the saved person is costly. Because we'll miss out on the promised land, so to speak. I'm not saying you miss out on heaven, you know, but the promised land is not heaven. You know, not, not in this reference. But to me, the, the promise then is the abundant life God wants to ha us to have when we just believe him. I'm not even saying you've got to understand it to believe it. If it's in the Word, believe it. Right. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to take those steps of faith and just believe it. Then in verse 15, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the rebellion. And it says that word today about three or four times in these passages. Today. You know, a lot of times we're, you know, we, we say, well, tomorrow. You know, we're having a, you know, a birthday, lunch today. We're, I'm not, but, you know, people might say, we're having a big feast today and cake and all. I say, I'll start my diet tomorrow. You know, I'll start my workout plan tomorrow. You know, we get to the new year. We're winding down 2023. We get ready. We got these things we're going to do in the new year and, you know, tomorrow. Uh, but the Lord says today. So how, how do we get untangled from this five Five quick things, five takeaways. Number one, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Because it's a conscious decision if we do that. It doesn't happen by accident saying, I will not do what God wants. I will not do what God says. I will not believe the word. And the Bible tells us that if we know to do good but don't do it, it's what? It's sin. It's sin, plain and simple. And the more we say no to God, the easier it's going to get to say no to God. Now, as a, as a pastor, as a parent, and now a grandparent, I can't help but notice how people raise their kids. You know, you see some kids, and their mom and dad to do, do, tell them to do something or whatever, and those kids just look at each split, they just hop right on, they do it. No, no questions asked, they just do it. Now, now, their mom and dad have taught them that way. I can promise you that. You know, you know all kids are different. But, you know, their parents probably have worked with them. Then, then other parents teach by decibel, right? I'm not, I'm not casting any, you know, probably if, if that was you. But, but it's like, hey, Johnny, stop that. Johnny, I said to stop that. You know, then every time the decibels go up a little bit. Johnny, middle name, last name, you know, you know how when they get to that point, they're saying all your names. I told you to stop that. Well, let me tell you something. That kid knows when you really mean it because a parent has trained him to know what the decibel level is. You know, okay, 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 I'm going to stop it right now because I don't want whatever comes next, right? You, you, you know, so, so, so in an opposite way, they've conditioned Johnny to not pay attention. And I'm saying that's how we get with God. L listen, friends, God starts with a still small voice of the Holy Spirit says, walk in this way. Live this way. Do this. Follow this. This is God's word. And then maybe it gets a little bit louder. Maybe you hear a similar type thing, you know, from, from a devotion, from a message, and, 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 but you keep saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to spend time like that in the Word. I'm not going to be part of that. Uh, I'm not going to do what the Bible says there. And next thing, you tune God out, and all of a sudden, that Holy Spirit's not really talking to you anymore. 
because you're just not listening. These children of Israel, they've been delivered by the plagues, the Passover, the God who brought them through the Red Sea. He gave them manna from heaven, and 1 Corinthians 10 says, with all those blessings, with all that I did, their bodies were still scattered in the wilderness and they perished because their hearts were hard. You know, this, is what, this is what they were talking They did not believe. Secondly, be aware of unbelief. I'm telling you about it today so you can be aware of it. And verse 12 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Now, now, notice how what it says is sinful, unbelieving heart. It's, it's a heart that turns away from God. We're not talking about murder or any of those big things which probably be a terrible sin. You know, the Bible is saying that unbelief, man, that, that, that's not good stuff. You know, be aware of it. Don't let that happen to you. You know, believe in God's grace. Believe in the gospel message. Don't think you've got to add to it or change it. You know, that you've got to contribute something because God says that's an evil, unbelieving heart. You're not believing God's simple message of grace. Thirdly, examine yourself. Verse 13 says, encourage one another daily. See, I, we examine ourselves, you know, personally, but encouragement is done in community. That's why God established the church, the body of Christ. Later in Hebrews chapter 10, we are encouraged to exhort one another, provoke one another to love and good works. If you've ever watched a fire burning and maybe the, the, the wood's burning down, you've got a whole lot of coals there. And, you know, if you take one of the coals and, and you move it away from the other ones, after a while, that's going to quit glowing. The other ones are going to keep, you know, growing and growing and getting hot and hot until they, they finally burn out. But you take that one out of there. And friends, listen, Christians, we're like that. We need fellowship with one another. We need to be together. We need to encourage. We need to sit together under the word of God. We need to sing together and worship together and study the Bible together. Iron sharpens iron. You know, we share each other's stories and our victories and our problems. We, 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 we glow as we stay close to the Lord and one another. That's, that, you know, I'm, that's just how it is. It's easier to stay in fellowship with Christ as we fellowship with one another. Okay? He said, encourage one another every day as long as it's called today. And, and, and again, today, if you hear his voice, and then today, you know, again, if you hear his voice. And so he, what he's saying is it's essential that on a regular basis we do this. Okay? Fourthly, preserve to the end. Verse 14, Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. What he's saying is that perseverance is both the result and the evidence of true saving faith. You know, yeah, we've entered the race. We're going to stand it until it's over. We're going to keep going. I'm a partaker of Christ, so I persevere. And the, one of the proofs that we have, we're generally saved, is we just keep on believing. We just keep on. We just keep on keeping on. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. What's the opposite of hardening your heart? It's softening your heart. It's being receptive to the word of the Lord. Then lastly, value Genuine faith, value having faith. The writer said, you've got to understand this explanation now. The last verses of this chapter say, beginning with verse 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those who Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? Verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Who was it that heard, but yet they rebelled? It was those who left Egypt. Guess what, they, guess what they experienced for 40 years? They had manna every day. God was upset at them. He wasn't going to let them enter the rest of the promised land, but he fed them every day. Okay? Took care of them. They survived. And the Bible says their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, miraculous things happened, but they were not going to enter in because of unbelief. Let me just say this. God's deliverance from some problem is not sufficient evidence of your salvation. Because he delivered them over and over again. And just because God maybe heard a prayer, or answered, or delivered you from a problem or, you know, friends, what Hebrews is saying is they weren't genuine believers. You know, they rebelled. They didn't believe the word of the Lord. Now, it was the same people that he sent manna from heaven, right? It was the same people that he took care of all those years, but yet they perished in the wilderness except for, all, except for Joshua and Caleb and all those under 20. See, God can provide for you and be provoked at the same time by you. He causes the rain to fall on who? The just and the unjust. You know, I don't, I don't ever see rain clouds just hanging over Christian people when they need rain, right? It's over everybody. 
I don't know, except in Nash County, I can leave the church here where it's pouring rain, go to my house a couple miles down the road, it's not raining. So anyway, that's not what I'm talking about here, right? You know what I'm saying. But why? God is, God is gracious and he kind. He, he, he was to Esau. He gave Esau his own country while Jacob lived in a tent. And the Bible says, Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? Well, you know the answer to all these. You come tell me and I'll, I'll know. Don't think that just because God provides it is evidence of strong faith. He said, they'll not enter my rest. He was patient with them. He didn't instantly kill them. They wandered in the wilderness. So in verse 19, he says, we see that they were not able to enter because of one thing, unbelief. If unbelief was the one thing that kept them from entering God's rest, what, what's the one thing that gives us God's rest? It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith. So let me just close with this part of a story from John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. You probably all have heard of this. Hopefully you've read it. Story of a guy named Christian, which is, a, you know, that's his name. It's an allegory of the Christian walk. And the narrator watches Christian and Hopeful as they arrive at the river in front of the celestial city. Okay, they've lived their life. They're escorted across the river and through the gates of Pearl, you know, the pearly gates. But as the gates close and Christian and Hopeful are now finally home, they're in heaven, they're in the celestial city, the narrator turns his attention to another person who arrives at the river, and their name is Ignorance. There, there's a fairy to meet him in a fairy called Vain Hope. Mr. Vain Hope is not only too happy to escort Ignorance across the river, he gets him to the gates of the celestial city. And when Ignorance comes up to the gate, he looked up to the writing that was above and began to knock, supposing the entrance should be open. He's there at the gate. But he was asked by the men that overlooked the top of the gate, Whence come you, and what... What you have, he answered, I've eaten and drinking with the king. Okay, this is an allegory, but it goes along with the Bible. Because Jesus said in the last day, there were going to people who said, Lord, did we not cast out demons and did we not heal the sick, do all these things in your name? And he's going to say, what, depart from me, I, I never knew you. And how do we know God? By faith, you know, by, by belief. Then they asked him, the keepers of the gate, asked him for a certificate that they might go in and show it to the king. So he fumbled in his bosom and he found none. They, then they said, have you none? But the man never answered a word. So they told the king, but he would not come down to see him, but commanded the two shining ones, you know, like angels, that conducted Christian and hopeful to the city to go out and take ignorance and bind him hand and foot and have him away. They took him up and carried him through the air to the door that I saw in the side of the hill. Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. What a shame to go through life. Lord, Lord, haven't we done mighty works in your name? But inside is an evil heart of unbelief. It's, it's scandalous that God would look at sinners and say, I will separate all of your sin from you as far as east from the west, if you'll just believe what you didn't believe. And friends, I tell you, it is a little bit scandalous to, to try to believe everything that's in the book, but it is the good news. It doesn't make sense to our mortal minds. It doesn't seem right. But I'm telling you, I, I read the Bible and it's good news to me. You know, you, you see Jesus on the cross and the thief on either side. And one guy just mocked him. The other said, Lord, I believe. And, the, and Jesus said, you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, this guy had done everything wrong that he could do. He's being hung for his crimes legitimately. But at the last moment, he believes on the Lord and he gets in. Now, I'm not by any means suggesting that you live that way and hope that you get a last chance to do that. Because everything I just read, you read these passages again when you get home. It, how many times? So today, if you hear his voice. Today, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Today, you know, if the Lord's moving you from some place of unbelief to belief, take care of that today. Amen? Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, and I know that Satan tries every way he can to get us tangled in a web of sin, living our life with guilt and shame, not believing the message of the gospel that Jesus makes us new, takes away all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt, all that old life, and gives us a new life. We are a new creation in Christ as a Christian. That's the fact. And Father, I pray that no one here that's heard this message today will, will enter eternity in any other way to hear the voice of the Lord saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, I pray for those today that have errors of unbelief. Lord, I don't believe they're having unbelief in the sense of a hard heart. They might be struggling more with just doubt and fear and anxiety. And Lord, these are things that we need to give to you. 
We need to unhitch our wagon from those type of things because they'll wear us down and wear us out. So, Father, we, we come to you today humbly asking for your help in our time of need, asking for the hope that our lives need, asking for, like that man that said, I believe and help my unbelief. Lord, I believe many are here like that today. Just say, Lord, I believe. Help me to believe better than I'm believing. Help me to have the faith that I need to take this next step of faith in my life, this next step. Hallelujah. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're the loving, serving, faithful God. That you're mighty in every way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, one more time, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. You can also go to our website, eagrm.org. We would love to hear from you and get you connected with our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next Sunday, as we come back together for another great weekend of online church. We look forward to having you join us. And so, until we see each other again, Stay safe, take care, and God bless. Have an awesome Sunday.